He's alive. That's pretty good. Well, good morning. It is great to see you guys this morning. I didn't get to say hi, everybody, so hi, everybody. We're glad you're here. We kicked our kids out, so now no one will behave. I know how you people are. Uh, This week is Palm Sunday, and let me give you a little thing. So, you know, here's the thing about what we believe about Jesus. We don't believe Jesus was just a man. We don't believe that we are equal to him. We believe that Jesus is God, and Palm Sunday is the fulfillment of Scripture from the Old Testament, the laying down of palm branches as Jesus came into town on a donkey to represent he's coming in peace, not on a horse. And so we lift Jesus up, name above every other name. We don't believe any other prophet is equal. We don't uh, uh, worship anyone else. We worship the God who is Jesus, the Trinity. This week, if you want to do something during Passion Week that would really uh, impact you. Um, Passion Week's the week we celebrate Jesus comes in uh, to Jerusalem, and we celebrate that today. And then all during the week, different things happen, and, and you can download all the different passages to, to read, and that's fine if you want to do that. Or, or if you're like me and you're not really sharp, you can just go to John chapter 12 and go from John chapter 12 to chapter 20. And if you want to just read a couple of those each day as you go in, you, you will get an idea of what was happening with Jesus every day. As he comes in and people are worshiping him and they're so happy that he's there uh, uh, once again, you know, king of the Jews. And by the end of the week, they're yelling, crucify him. And so um, that's what we're looking at today. So let me ask you a question today. Today we're going to talk about how can I create a place for growth And let me just see what kind of people we have here. Do you know what this is? Grocery bag, right? Grocery bag? Okay, we're going to find out who you are. uh, See if these are my people. How many of you try to get every bag out of the car into the house in one trip? How many of you do that? Yes, okay. You're my people. Those of you who don't, I don't know if you just have too much time or if you have very few people at your house. I'm not sure which, but... uh, But those of us who think that we are uh, super people try to carry all the bags at once. Now, let me tell you what happens. You you know, you've heard me talk about ADD being a little squirrel meeting. Let me tell you about the squirrel meeting that goes on every time I do this. Every time I do this. Number one, I always say, you know, it's not that much work to make another trip. That's one squirrel. That's the logical squirrel that says, hey, listen, you, you don't have to carry all these. But then the other competitive squirrels which there's many more, says, get them all. You can get them all. But then there's cautious squirrel that speaks up and says, you remember the story about the guy who lost fingers. Have you heard that one? Some guy tried to carry too many groceries and somehow he lost fingers. I don't even know the whole story. It's just every time, every single time, I've got the groceries and I've got bags everywhere and they're on my fingers and arms and wrapped around my arm and my hand turns purple as I'm heading into the house. And of course, there's always the Gatorade thing. So you're grabbing that with this hand and then there's milk. They did. They said, do you want a bag or not? You said no, because you were being nice. And then you're regretting it because you could carry everything if it wasn't for that milk. And you head into the house like a maniac. And then you try to figure out where can I put all these without dying or breaking stuff? By the way, how many of you have actually broken something because you did what I just said? Yes, you are my people. Thank you. Thanks for being a part. So, so here's the deal about your life. You don't get more than one grocery bag. And you get to decide what goes in it. Now, every week we at some point talk about conviction and about sin. So there are dumb things that we put in our bag, right? And we know what those are and we confess those to God. But the truth is, and when we come to Palm Sunday, we talk about what we have choices about. And the truth is, I, I, you know, do you have junk at your house? Like you ever look around like, I probably should get rid of that. Well, we do the same thing at our church, and so last night I just took 12 seconds to gather a few boxes that Randy left in the back, and uh, uh, not to point Randy out, but there's Randy right there, Um, and this is an empty box, And, and yet it's taking up space. Now, what do I know about an empty box? It doesn't have value. Here's the thing about us, okay? When we have sin in our lives and we do something destructive, maybe it's pride, maybe it's arrogance, maybe it's anger. Listen, the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin and of righteousness. But here's the other part. Sometimes we're so busy filling our lives with things that don't matter. Things that bring no value to our life or anybody else's life. 
that we don't have room to do the things that God's calling us to do to really make a difference in eternity with the few thousand weeks we might have left on earth. Yeah, do the math. You'll start to figure it out. And so what do we have to do? Well, in order to make room, we have to decide. Just like the people on Palm Sunday laid down branches, they took something that they were cutting probably for a shelter, but they laid those at Jesus' feet and says, here you, here you go. And the truth is, for some of us, it's not even as much sin as it is It's just Netflix or extra things we do that we don't really need to do. And we've got to allow room to allow God to help us to grow. Because we can't grow without laying down the things that don't really matter. Of course, we lay down the sins. We lay down those encumbrances. But we also have other things in our lives that we need to lay down. And so today, as you look at this, here's what I want you to know. If you don't remember anything else, remember this sentence. And I don't remember the first place I heard it. But God loves you where you are right now. And he loves you too much to leave you there. So if you're seeking a relationship with God or you're in a relationship with God or you've given your life to Christ as a believer, the Holy Spirit is prompting you to do the things he's called you to do. He's not just leaving you where you are. He's helping you to grow. And so how can we make room for growth in our life? Number one, honor Christ. Here we pick this up, John chapter 12. By the way, we'll be taking the Lord's Supper in a couple minutes. I know the ADD people are like, when are we doing that? When are, when are we doing that? Are we doing that soon? Should I put this down? Should I put it on the ground? Should I pick it up? What should I do? Okay, so it's coming. Honor Christ. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem because Passover was coming. So there was a festival happening. The people were coming into town. One of the things they did, by the way, was remove all yeast from their house. That had to be a fun time to remove. How would you like to do that? Remove all yeast? And my entire house would be just about empty. There'd be some green beans and uh, I think that's it. All right. So the next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's from Psalms 118. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Zechariah. Chapter 9, you can look at to see the Old Testament. What do you need to lay down in order to honor Christ in your life? What do you need to lay down in order for Jesus to be lifted up in your life? What in your life maybe is not necessarily even bad? Maybe it's not even what you would consider sin, but it's in the way of you doing what God's called you to do. What do you... Laying down. You know, one of the neat things to me is the different folks who've stepped up and said, I want to get baptized. One of the ladies that's in her 80s said to me, I'm ready to get baptized. I remember when I got baptized and I remember having to take that first step of faith. It was terrifying and it was a lake and it was cold. And it was in front of about a hundred students that I had led for years but I realized that I had never been baptized as a believer. I was baptized as a child, but I wanted to be baptized as a believer. And for me to do that, what did I have to lay aside? My pride, my fear, my arrogance even. To say, I don't need that. To let God do that in my life. Here's the next passage. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do... Do all for the glory of God. Time out. That word glory there is where we get the word doxology. You remember the doxology? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Right? By the way, they found if you sing the song, same songs every week, you forget what they are about. So you have to refresh your mind and, and redo the song. So if you heard an old hymn, we had a hymn today. If you're not careful, you just sing it. You didn't even pay attention to the words. So it's important to make yourself aware of that and to do that. Anyway, so they came out and they, they said, hey, whether you eat or drink, do all for the glory, which means pointing to him of God. Don't cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way. Why? For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many so they may be saved. Listen, anytime you step out to lay part of your life at God's feet, whether it's God, I'm willing to serve you. God, I want to I be baptized. God, I want to give my life to you. 
Lord, I want to take that next step. I want to join a small group. Oh, no, I was around people one time, and I don't like what happened. And you have to lay down that fear. Anytime you step out in faith, there's excitement and there's fear. Had somebody call me that said, hey, I want to go into ministry. And they were saying, what do you do? And I said, you take a step at a time. I said, anytime you're taking a step of faith, it's exciting and it's terrifying. God, I want to do what you call me to do. And so today I would ask you, what do you need to take out of the bucket? What do you need to take out of the grocery bag so that you can put in something God's calling you to do? Now, let me talk about how Surfside helps people to grow real quick. I'm just going to talk about this for just a minute because... Just like we have grades, we talk about how Surfside uses environments for growth. So these are different areas that we help people and work on places to grow. So we talk about the foyer, and this is an image. So those of you with great imaginations, this will help you if you're like me. Those of you who are very linear and like numbers, just imagine it's one, two, three, four. The foyer, right? In Florida, we have a foyer. Nobody stands there during the summer. But what happens? Somebody comes to the door. And if it's not the Amazon person, you do not open the door. Isn't it amazing how we greet pizza people, Amazon people, and the other people? We're looking, what are they doing here? In Miami, when somebody knocks on your door, the first thing you do is put the chain on and put your foot behind the door. Do you remember those days? First time I moved up here, the people I stayed with, I said, oh, do you have a key to the house? They said, no, we just leave our doors open all the time. I went, what? Right? What's the foyer? The foyer is the place you get to know people. So we consider things like the internet and people watching online and other things. The way you can invite a friend. They've never been here to church, so what are you doing? You're just introducing them. We do a fall festival so people can get to just get to know. And they're like, wow, these people are not normal, just like me. Right? So the foyer. And then the living room. That's Sunday mornings. Sunday mornings we have family here, but we also have guests. We know that every week we have guests. Paul talked about how we had to, in worship, make sure that we pay attention because there might be an unbeliever here who doesn't know anything about Jesus. And if we act like maniacs, he doesn't use the word maniacs, but we want to see them come to Christ. So what do we do? We're a family, but we know we have guests. Just like if I had people over my house when my kids were little, when Kyle was little, he was so cute, but he was very energetic. And so we'd have family over and before they'd come over, I'd say, now listen, Kyle, we're going to have guests here. You will not run through the house. You will not misbehave. You will not scream. You will not chase things. You will not throw things. You will be good. And what would happen? So the people would come over, and what would inevitably happen? I'm talking, hey, it's good to see you guys. So glad you could come visit our house. And then inevitably, Kyle comes running through, ah! and I go, hang on just a second. Kyle, do you remember the talk that we had before they got here? I'm just really sorry, right? And so what do we do? We we understand that we have guests, so what do we do? We give them coffee. We give them donuts in the morning. We try to make them feel welcome, let them know we care about them. We go out of our way to say hi to them. I mean, wouldn't it be weird if you went to somebody's house and you knocked on the door and rang the doorbell, you knew they were in there, and they just yelled, come on in. That's good when you're family. And then you came in, and they literally ignored you for two hours. Can you imagine? Happens at churches all the time. So we're a family, but we understand we have guests. And then finally, and then next is the kitchen. The kitchen is a place you get to know people. That's small groups. That's our team members. When you get to know people so you can miss them. We get our Bible studies so that you get to know people. It's where discipleship takes place. It's where somebody can really say to you, how you doing? And they don't mean it New York style. By the way, when a New Yorker says to you, how you doing? They don't care how you're doing. They're just saying hi. So what you're supposed to do is look back at them and go, how you doing? That's all you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to say, well, I'm doing well. How are you, sir? Don't, don't do that. If they're from New York and they say, how are you doing? You, you just answer in kind. How are you doing? How are you doing? That means hi, hi. Okay, for those of you who are Southerners, it means hey, y'all. Okay, all right. And then the backyard, what's that? That's a place we go out to minister to people in our community and around the world. We actually have a mission trip coming up in North Carolina. Let me give you a specific. Every, I'm going to give you this general statement, then I'm going to give you one specific thing on every point. So here it is. I want you to look at your schedule for life. Are you making time to spend time with Christ? Are you making time to read your Bible every day? Not just to read it like you're in a hurry, but to read it and say, God, would you speak to me today? I want to encourage you to look at your life and say, is is my life so full of junk that I've not given time to worship Christ? Number two, remember the sacrifice of Christ. So I want to just give you an illustration. We had a rocket go off the other day, right? 
Did you know about it? Those guys paid a touch of money to fly in the rocket. Do you know how much they paid? Anybody know? Fifty-five million each. Each. So, now, let me look around. Okay, anybody in here that would love to go to the space station? That would be like a dream. You would love to do that. So, you'd love to go to the space station. So, so here's the deal. Let's just imagine that one of those guys called you and said, hey, you go in my place. You'd be like, is this a joke? Am I on candid camera? And you don't even know what candid camera is. And yet, you said that, right? So, so can you imagine, though, if somebody said to you, come on, you ride in the rocket, I'm just going to stay home. You'd be like, no way, that's huge. Listen, the sacrifice that Jesus gave for us is way beyond any amount anyone could pay. I, I've never had an argument with anybody on whether or not they're a sinner. I mean, I've had people tell me they're professionals at it. But I've never had anybody, well, maybe one person, say, oh, I never sin. And that person was arrogant, so there you go, right? And so the truth is, we know we're sinners, so we know we can't make our way to God. So what did Jesus do? He took our place. He exchanged for us. So Jesus brings his disciples in, and we're going to look in, in Matthew chapter 26, and he's having the Lord's Supper, what we call now the Lord's Supper. He's having Passover. So before we get to that place, if you want to take just a minute and clear the clear plastic back. Did everybody get, anybody need the elements? Nice. Clear this part back and you can have the, the wafer, which by the way is bitter. And then you can pull back to have the juice. So Jesus is gathering with his disciples for what was called the Passover. And that represented the escape from Egypt where they used Matzah to represent that they were in a hurry and the fact that yeast represented sin so they got rid of all the yeast That's the reason we use flat untasty bread And Jesus changed it Instead of it representing the blood over the door instead of it represented fleeing from Egypt instead of this just representing that trip out of bondage He changed everything it meant before we have the Lord's Supper together, would you just bow your heads right where you're at? Take a moment and just thank God for what he's done for you. Take a moment and just recognize that there's no way we can even fathom what he's done. Take a moment, if there's any area of your life where you're not agreeing with God, just take a moment to agree with him, confess your sin, and ask him to renew you. Lord, thank you for this time. May we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus, the beginning of the story starts this way. Going to the city, a certain man tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. So we know the whole thing. Jesus washing his disciples' feet. Jesus has a lot of conversations with them. That's once again, you can look in the book of John for that. And then he says this. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Take and eat in remembrance of him today. Then he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink in remembrance of him. Then Jesus says this, which is amazing. Listen to what he says next. I tell you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So here's what's cool. We're going to have Lord's Supper in heaven. It probably tastes a lot better than what you just had. But the truth is, this is a representation not only of what Jesus did, but looking forward to the fact that you and I are able to celebrate with him him in heaven. One day people will say, Eric's gone, but I won't be gone. I would just have fallen asleep here and be awake in heaven. I don't know how it happens. It might be, what does this button do? <laughs> my tombstone could possibly say, I told you I was sick for my wife who never thinks I'm sick. 
But one day I'll fall asleep here. And one day, if you're a believer together in heaven, we will take the Lord's Supper again together with the one that we celebrate. And it will be looking back at what he did and how we don't deserve to be here. But because of his blood, we're here. What's the next step God has for you? Listen to what Jesus said, John 12, 32. And when I am lifted up from earth, I will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. Can I tell you a second thing that I want to encourage you to do? Yeah, you can pick this up. Ask God. Ask God to do this. God, I want to have more of you in my life. So that when people get around me, they think, what's different about him? What's different about her? What, what is different about my uncle? What is different about my aunt? What's different about my grandma? What's different about my grandfather? What is it about them? And here's the deal. When you lift up Christ in your life, when you lay down your selfishness and self-interest and your self-everything, and you fill your life with him, people get around you and you lift him up. Who is it that you can get around and say, God, I want to just lift you up. I want to give you a challenge this week to invite somebody to Easter service. Not because we need to be full. I, 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 Chris and I've had this conversation a few times. I, it's, it's anymore. I'm getting old. So I'm like, Easter's going to be full no matter what you do. But here's the thing. If you invite a neighbor, last night, by the way, one of our brand new members had two neighbors show up, two different neighbors showed up for church together. And you know what they said? They said, if you don't invite anybody to church, they won't come. But if you invite them, there's like a 70% chance they'll come. And so invite somebody to church. Now I know what that does to you. Suddenly they know you're a Christian. Maybe you've never told them you're a Christian. Maybe you're not a Christian yet, but you're thinking, you know, the pastor might tell a good joke, so why don't you come to church? Listen, if you're a believer, I want to encourage you. One of the ways to step out in faith, and it's terrifying, is to invite one of your neighbors or friends to church service. So I want to encourage you to do that. Number two. Number three. Serve others like Christ. Can I tell you that when you serve Christ, everything in you is going to fight you? You're going to come up with every excuse. Yesterday, I went to Provost Park yesterday morning uh, with Rotary to pick up trash. Can I tell you, before I left home... I had excuse fun. All the squirrels. There were no pro pickup squirrels. They were all encouraging staying home. It was cold. There'll be plenty of people there. It's your wife's birthday. That's true. It was her birthday. She had to go to work, but it was her birthday. So I could have used that. Oh, I'm cleaning the house. Right? Every excuse I could think of. But you know what I did? I went. Because I had committed to go. So I went. For the first about half hour, I was one of the few people there. And I got to have a good conversation with one of the leaders there. Whenever you're going to do something that matters, can I tell you that everything inside of you will fight against you? You know what that first workout's like. You know, you made that commitment. I'm going to get up and walk tomorrow. And then you wake up. Oh, I didn't know tomorrow came so quick. <laughs> right? And everything fights against you. Listen. God, I want to be obedient to you. I want to serve others like you. What did Jesus do? Here's what we celebrate this week. John 13. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to this pla his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. And the disciples did what they normally do. Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. No, no idea. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. I set you an example that you should do as I've done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant's greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. We have so many wonderful people that serve in so many ways. I mean, you were greeted this morning. There were signs out front. There was coffee here. There were donuts here. There were people that welcomed you, people that came up on the stage, people who, like Rodney, who gave us a word from the Lord. People who prayed for you before you came. Somebody who made sure the driveway was cleaned up. I mean, so many people contributed to you even being able to be in here this morning. Thank God we have a good air-conditioned guy who can make the heat and the cold work. Especially air conditioning. It takes all kinds of people. 
But when you start to step out and do what God's called you to do, it's always, listen, listen, it's always a sacrifice. I would love to sit home this morning and just watch the newest series on Netflix or whatever. Be great. And don't you think that pastors don't have that discussion with themselves some mornings, right? You're the same way, just like me. And Mark 10 says this, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave to all. Why? Because even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. What's the next step you need to take? When I got baptized and stepped out in faith, I'm telling you, that was hard. So maybe for you, that's the next step. Maybe for you, it's becoming a member of a church. Maybe for you, it's joining a small group. Maybe for you, you know that you could teach a Bible study, but you just don't want to. Well, ask God what he wants you to do. And then obey him. Obedience always takes sacrifice. But here's what you'll find out too. I understand there's a lot of in the box. And it's easy to get busy in life and get frustrated. And sometimes even look at what you've given away over the years and think, I've done all this and I don't see God doing anything. That happened to me last week. Where I said, God, what's God doing? Why, why am I still doing this? I've been doing this a long time. Why, do something else. I could drive a truck. I could drive a bus. I'm a great bus driver. I've only scraped a few guardrails. <laughs> Coming to college, Tennessee. That's a tight turn. That's where the youth are going this summer, by the way. I'm not driving. So here's the deal. Anytime you step out to do what God wants you to do, you get discouraged. So what do you need to do? Look back at what God's done. You know what happened this week? God did this. I know that God did this. I had three different former students that I worked with who all are pastors now. And all three of them are inviting people to their Easter services and all three of them are doing God's will and walking in God's light. And I look back at the discouragement I had even when I was their youth pastor or in one case, just their Bible study leader. And I think, I remember sitting in Bible study going, are they getting anything out of this? I remember the, the youth group where we got pudding all over the church building. I don't know why they didn't fire me. Everywhere. Gallons of pudding. And that guy, Josh, is now a leader of a campus in West Palm Beach for a church. When you look back and you decide to do what God calls you to do, and you get rid of the junk and you start saying, God, I'll just be obedient. You may not see what he's doing today, but you can look back and see the wake of love and righteousness God's brought. God loves you right where you're at today, but he loves you too much to leave you there. So I want to encourage you, just take the next step, whatever that is for you. Take a step of faith this week and ask God, God, I'm going to lay that down for you. Let's close in prayer today. Father, thank you for this time. I thank you for your will. I thank you for your love for us. Lord, I thank you that at Calvary, you laid down your life for us because you loved us. So, Father, may we lay our lives down for others. Father, I pray in this next week as we leave this place, that your word wouldn't just leave us, Father, but, but we would look and, Lord, we desire to do your will. Father, that one today who maybe doesn't know you, I pray today would be the day they surrender to you, knowing that you are the way, the truth, and the life. Father, I pray also for that one today who's struggling right now. Lord, they feel like their life is just so full. Lord, I pray you would just show them whatever simple step they need to take to lay down their own lives, for the lives of others. Father, we pray for the people who are going to come next week. Some who haven't been to church in years. I pray you would draw them home to you. Lord, we love you. Thank you for Palm Sunday. Where we celebrate the fact that we can lay down everything before you. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.